Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is September 8th, 2015, and my guest is Mitchell Weiss, 35-year veteran of Broadway as a general manager, company manager, house manager, and the co-author with Perry Gaffney of The Business of Broadway. Mitch, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you, Russ. Glad to be here. So let's start with your career. How did you get started? And um, give us some flavor of your experience, uh, which is quite, uh, quite wide. I w- always wanted to work on Broadway. I grew up in New York. I didn't quite know what I was going to end up doing. I was a piano player. And uh, my first jobs in summer stock was as a musical director. Um, But the choice was, do I want to be a big fish in a little pond, or am I fine with being a little fish in a big pond? And there were certain people on Broadway that were my idols, like Harold Prince and Stephen Sondheim and Joseph Papp. And I was willing to empty their garbage cans for free. And I went and told them that. And I walked into their offices and tried to make friends with the receptionists and do everything I could uh, coming out of college. And eventually got one of those jobs as an assistant press representative, which, of course, was nothing that I knew anything about nor understood. Yeah, Uh, that was a Harold Prince, Stephen Sondheim musical, award winning musical called Pacific Overtures. Sure. Back in 1976. Um, Great experience. I met a lot of people. I learned a lot of things for life, not just the business and Uh, Rather than, even though I still wanted to stay in the music end, uh, rather than uh, wait on tables, as most people in show business do eventually, um, I decided to work in producers' offices. And I went from there to, uh, because the show didn't last very long, it opened the same year as uh, Chicago and Pacific, and uh, Chorus Line, so it didn't have a chance. Um. I went on to Equus with uh, the veteran producer Kermit Bloomgarden, who had also produced Diary of Anne Frank and The Miracle Worker. He was he was a miracle worker. He was an amazing man, and this was his, uh, his last show, uh, Equus and Poor Murderer, which also was a flop. But I learned again learned a lot. Uh, they used to throw paper at me and say, uh, you deal with the investors, read the uh, prospectus yourself, and if they have questions, answer it. And that was it. That's how I started to learn it. So from there, it was from one office to the other um, while I was still trying to find some way to do music. Um, So, uh, But at some point, you became a manager, which is a a particular kind of manager, which there are different kinds, as you detail in your book. Um, talk about how you get that break and what was the first show you had that you would say you had a, quote, lot of responsibility on, and what was that like? Well, uh, the the simple answer is uh, there's a union called ATPAM, the Association of Theatrical Press Agents and Managers. Uh, When I was working for Joseph Papp at the Public Theater, uh, he had the show A Chorus Line. That was his production. Uh, at the time, the most successful show in history. Um, and I got to work on it. And eventually I got to apprentice with a manager on that show. Uh, and you had at the time, you had to take three years of apprenticeship, study uh, all the union rule books, take 18 seminars, and then take a six hour oral and two, uh, I'm sorry, six hour written and two hour oral test just to be allowed to go to get a job as a manager. There's so much money at stake that the union takes it very seriously. So I, there's good money in doing it. So I decided to follow the path and I lucked out. My first show was a quarter line. Uh, it had already been running, but it, 
the most amazing show. Everyone loved it. The audiences loved it. There was so much money coming in. We never had a problem because of that money. And I was still working in the nonprofit sector, <laughs> which was pretty, pretty amazing. You know, uh, just like six years into the show, we had already taken in $338 million. Uh, this is back in the 70s. So you can imagine. It's a lot of money even then. <laughs> a lot of money. Even then. And it was all going back to nonprofit theater. Uh, it was pretty, it was a lot of fun. You know, we, uh, we produced 27 new shows a year off Broadway. We did television, we did film, we did free Shakespeare in Central Park. Uh, we had a staff of 600. There's no theater like that now. And there wasn't one at that time. Uh, it was a highlight of not just my life, but pretty much the theater world. Um, so Chorus Line was the uh, first show I got to actually be a union manager on. And union managers are allowed, we're trained to be um, company managers, house managers, which uh, in other places is called a theater manager, I guess. Um, and also press agents. We're all allowed to take each other's jobs <laughs> and sub for each other and... Uh, uh, because we know the finances and the ins and outs of uh, our world. We're trained. And it's a very small group. The The number of, of people who are capable, uh, because they're union membership, to be involved in a management role on a day-to-day -day basis in a Broadway show is roughly how many people? Well, let, let's start with there are only 40 Broadway theaters, but the union does work across the country at some of the touring theater companies, uh, theater uh, houses. Uh, but there's a total of about 650 people in the union who are allowed to be a press agent, a house manager, and a company manager. Um, and as I said, if there are only 40 theaters and you can hire three people for each theater, one, one runs the theater, one runs the show, and one's the press agent, it means there are a lot of jobs uh, unfilled. <laughs> need, uh, people need a lot more jobs. Yeah, a lot of people. Well, it's a very competitive business, obviously. And uh, look, just a few uh, before we get into some of the details of a Broadway show, uh, I'd like to get a little more uh, of your taste and, and experience. Roughly, how many shows have you worked on in your career? I uh, stopped counting at about 180. Okay. Um, yeah, that includes off Broadway and a few regional uh, theater shows um, and touring shows, but most of them were uh, Broadway and off Broadway. So, and, so is Chorus Line your favorite show still? Oh, hands down, hands down. Everybody on it loved working there. Uh, we had great events, great experiences. Um, we had perhaps the best night of theater. Uh, mm -hmm. certainly that I've ever experienced when Co A Chorus Line became the longest running show in history back in 1983. It no longer is, of course, but at that time, no show had run that long. Um, we had a special event that uh, brought in all 450 performers who had ever been in the show anywhere in the world and they were all flown in and they all performed the show at the same time in one theater for a star-studded audience just as a press event. And it cost a fortune. It, it, the logistics were overwhelming. And everybody worked day and night for days and everybody was smiling from the stagehands to the musicians. No one had a problem. It was one of those glorious experiences that you get once in a lifetime. Uh, you write in the book that the stage itself was not strong enough to support 450 people. And we only found that out the day before. And so we, what happened? We, well, the city engineers were there and we have our stagehands and we went out and bought a whole bunch of lumber and we reinforced that <laughs> stage in an hour, that thing had so many beams underneath it, uh, and everything went fine you know, at that point. Um, it could have been a catastrophe. 
what, 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 is, what does it mean they all performed it at the same time? Well, uh, it was the show was slightly rewritten to exchange cast members as the show went on from beginning through the end. However, in the finale, uh, which is supposed to have the entire cast in it, all 450 people, some of them started in the aisles, some of, the, some of them started up in the balcony, but they all eventually ended up doing the kick line on that stage. It, it was staged so that all 450 could fit. Wow. It, it was pretty stunning. That's pretty cool. So how about a show that you wish that you had worked on that you didn't get to? What, what's your biggest uh, miss that you wish you'd had a chance to be part of? Oh, Lord. Um, I probably Wicked. Um, again, because people there seem to enjoy the experience tremendously. Um, it's also a big moneymaker. Uh, it, there's something to be said for having a lot of money to solve problems. Um, the, you don't necessarily make more money as an employee. But the headaches are smaller. The headaches <laughs> are much smaller. And you get to do special events. You get to <coughs> excuse me, do the, um, do the public events that uh, make everyone's life, including the audience, stand out. Uh, currently, I wish I was uh, connected to Hamilton. Yeah, don't we all? <laughs> yeah, I just I just bought tickets for May. That's the, that's when they start to get somewhat uh, affordable. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. If it will ever be affordable, but again, that's the public theater. That's a nonprofit that created that show. What it's, is its seat, by the way? Do you know roughly? The where theater it's is over. Is it the Roger, Richard Rogers? I think. Yeah, it's uh, it's certainly over a thousand. I would. Guess that from memory, it's about 1,200 seats, 1,100, 1,200. Uh, it's not like a movie. See, that's one of the great things about the Broadway experience is you cannot uh, make a lot of money from a show that only runs a month. You know, movies go out there in one weekend, they come back with $500 million. Because they're in 3,000, 4,000 theaters. That's right. It's not possible. Uh, there was one point in which the producer, David Merrick, um, had come up with the idea. He was producing the show 42nd Street, and it was a big hit. Big hit, yeah. And he contemplated opening it in a second theater on Broadway at the same time. Uh, and it, he went through all the logistics of how do we do this and what's it going to cost. And ultimately, he decided not to do it. So we have no experience to know if it would ever work. It's an interesting uh, idea. I'm going to go back to Wicked for a second. I, yeah. I, I was lucky to see it without any uh, expectations. I was in New York with my wife. We wanted to see something. We were looking around trying to trying to decide what to watch. And it, it sounded kind of goofy, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wizard of Oz. I don't know. We it, 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 we didn't we didn't have very high expectations. Uh, we had we had a good seat though, which helped. And I remember coming out of the at the end of the first act, I was so overwhelmed. I, I think it's you know it's a it's a top five uh, intermission pre intermission number to find gravity. It's just it was so overwhelmed. I I said to my we we could go home right now. I mean this was I mean I don't want to, but it was so spectacularly great the first the first act. And when you walk out in the second act, you're with. I, I think it's um, – I think you said the, the largest Broadway theaters are just under 2,000, and that must right. be – that must be – it must be in one of those, right? It must be a close to 2,000-seat yes. theater. It, it's it, – it, interestingly enough, though, just as, as an aside, they actually chopped off some of their seats uh, that are hidden behind a wall in that theater. Wow. Not a lot of them. It was from the previous show, and they've just never undone <laughs> that. In that theater, I'm sure they could be making a lot more money, but they uh, they just decided to leave it alone. They were making enough, and they are. So, so as I walked out, I realized here, you know, I, I walked out just emotionally overwhelmed, uh, exhilarated, uh, and I'm not. I wasn't alone. There were another roughly two thousand people with the same feeling, and I thought, what an extraordinary thing! It's performed eight times a week. 16,000 people for 50 weeks a year for now, what, 10 years, roughly? How, how well, long? They're, they're on their 12th year. Are 
given bliss. <laughs> it's just nothing. I mean, you can, you can go to a baseball game and have a great time. I love sports. You can see an amazing sporting event. But that theater experience to deliver that day in, day out at that level of it's never like, well, it was just OK today. It's always spectacularly great when you have a, a hit like that. It, there's nothing like it. It's an, just an extraordinary thing. Well, actually, it's nice to hear uh, hear you say that, you know, sometimes we feel those of us who work on Broadway, we feel like um, critics and the audience aren't enjoying it as much as we are, that it is uh, the kind of thing where the process is more fun than the actual outcome. And certainly on certain shows, that's true. Uh, and hopefully they don't last very long. Um, it, people are always asking, how come that one's a hit and this other one wasn't? Why didn't the producer and the director and everybody know well, they that? Fix it, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, one of yeah, um, and there is a you know a lot of problems uh, with our process, perhaps, and uh, how we can fix things. Certainly, uh, Disney, I will say, um, came up with their own personal solution about how they were going to fix these things, and that was co by committee. They uh, take the show out of town. They usually do one or two different theaters. And basically, they're not allowed to fail, even though they have. They've had some shows that have not done well. But they bring shows in in which they have spent much more than the average producer because they have corporate uh, money to throw into it to make sure it's a hit. And it's a totally different strategy, as you point out, than, a, than a typical Broadway show, which is quote, hit or miss. Um, uh, yeah. Very famously, uh, their very first venture on Broadway, Beauty and the Beast, which I got to work on, um, there was a period of time at the beginning where they were making more money on the merchandise in the lobby than they were on ticket sales, um, as far as profit goes. I don't. Certainly, the ticket sales were higher, uh, and. They have revolutionized how almost every show on Broadway now does merchandise because we're all learning from them. And they figured it out. Hey, if we're doing Beauty and the Beast, we can sell more uh, merchandise even from the movie. Trinkets. and yeah. Right. We can sell more DVDs of the movie and everything is going to help each other. Their kind of synergy department that they have where one department supports another department, supports another department and – you know, uh, finds a new way to create new product in the fifth department. Um, it's an amazing feature, but since each Broadway show is typically its own corporation and it's very isolated from anything else, uh, most shows don't have that opportunity. They're a hit or miss situation. I want to come back for a second. We'll talk a lot more about the business side in a minute, but I want to, I want to just – ask you about the emotional side when you asked, you made the remark that when you're on the inside, you don't know if people react to it the way the performers and the, and this, and the people behind the scenes do. And of course, as you say, it's bad shows that, <laughs> that don't turn out that, that, that way. But, but when you have a, a mega hit like a chorus line or wicked or a Les Mis, you have a mega hit like that. One thing that, that is, that your book helps me appreciate is the, then the amount of stuff that goes on behind the scenes is so complex from the sets to the wardrobe to the lighting to the electricity to the music, the actual performers, the choreography, et cetera. And we in the audience, we just watch it. We just watch it. You know, we take it for granted. We, we, we don't. But of course, for the people inside, it's, it's a tightrope. There's an emotional tightrope. There's an incredible – Vulnerability. I think one of the things that it, you've ever, if you've ever experienced any theater from the inside, there's an incredible camaraderie because of that vulnerability. There's the fear of failure. There's the exposing of oneself vocally, physically. Just the you're out there on stage with thousands of people watching, and things go wrong. And everybody knows that. So from the inside, there's this incredible uh, tightrope experience. And we on the outside go, yeah, that was great. Yeah, well, everything went well. But on the inside, it's there's that unbelievable 
roller coaster of, of emotion. What's it like when that goes on day in, day out, eight days a week for a, a decade or more? Well, how, do, how do the performers, how do, how do you deal with that? You know, and, and what does it change? It's not just the performers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what, one of the exciting things about my job, um, it, it's probably the best part of my job, is that I know what every single person working on that show is doing, whether they're having, uh, their aunt is having a baby, whether their throat is going, whether there's an understudy that's going to need to go on, whether someone in the box office uh, is sneaking somebody in, which is very impossible to do at this point. Um, I know everyone's personal life. I know who's just had a terrible day because they lost their aunt, but they're going out on stage. Sure. I know who has been throwing up in the bathroom right up until curtain time. The audience, we, our job is to create theatrical magic. Yep. And that is the exciting part of it. And unlike, and, and maybe I'm wrong because I have never built a skyscraper, but the difference in my head is if you build a skyscraper, it's finished, it's totally rented out, everybody's in there, you're done. For us, we're building that skyscraper Every day, yeah. daily. Yeah. <laughs> and twice a day on matinee days. Yeah. So you come up with systems that the people in our unions with experience have learned to almost take for granted. You walk in, you know when you have to be there 15 minutes earlier than you would think you have to be there because you have to make sure a certain part of the stage is swept because there's extra damage to it every night in the performance or if you, you want to make sure that every single light bulb is still working. That is done before every single performance, twice a day on matinee days. We do not take that for granted. They're checked, their ladders pulled out, the floors are mopped. Every detail is taken uh, seriously. Well, just the props, just figuring out, making sure that if you have people have seen, stuff to touch and that they're supposed to carry stage at Lion King, it's <laughs> you lose your breath. What they have going on there, it so it's a genius. A genius designed the backstage at Lion King. The Lion King is amazing, and you see it on stage, but it has to go somewhere, yeah, and be available somewhere to make that show happen. So everyone who's backstage is running around with their talents and their skills, making sure and if something breaks, you have to have someone available immediately to either fix it or replace it. Does it, uh, does it by the way, that includes seats in the audience. And once a week, there is some seat, somebody sat wrong on the chair in the orchestra on the aisle, and they broke the seat and they didn't bother to tell anybody. We have somebody who runs out before the show and fixes the seat. We do not lose a seat. We don't take anyone for granted that way uh, if we can. I'm but, sorry. So, so when, you've had, when you've had a show, though, that runs for that long, first of all, although obviously things go wrong all the time ongoing, like the seat breaks or the lights burns out or the prop breaks and you've got to replace it for the next day. Obviously, they're, they're headache. They're constant issues. But at one point, it kind of it, it, does it ever get to the situation where it's kind of humming along from your perspective, and then thinking about the performer's perspective, is it ever like old hat just to get out there and just sing it, belt it out? Uh, yes and no, <laughs> Sorry. both answers. Uh, after X number of years, of course, uh, there be there's something about uh, the how your day goes when you're supposed to be somewhere. You get a little more um, sense of freedom of when you have to show up at work and what has to be done. However, cast members change and therefore you have to rehearse. It is required that there be rehearsals every week. If your show is running 25 years like Phantom, you're still rehearsing every week. Not everybody, but the stage managers are pulling understudies in, who are working alongside of regular performers, 
and they are going over certain songs or certain um, little dance steps that perhaps somebody didn't get right because we're always watching. It's, is this show good enough to be worth that whopping amount of money that is being charged on Broadway? Um, so I, there is a sense of, I may be a little bored with my job today, but give me until two o'clock when the phone has been ringing and I'm sure there'll be 300 emergencies that no one was expecting and we won't even be able to worry about whether we're bored. And, and that's the truth. It just changes. So talk about the performers. They're, um, as a manager, you've got to deal with, I assume, a lot of egos, uh, personal quirks, et cetera. <laughs> uh, you gotta have to be delicate about this. You don't have to name names. It's okay. uh, uh, <laughs> I'll name them all. <laughs> um, actually, I have to say that one of the joys is that back the, the backstage area, which is not glamorous, you know, uh, it's not like the, those big movie musical movies. Um, it kind of humbles everybody. Um, people get nervous in their role. Sometimes they need their private time to prepare, uh, certainly in a serious drama. Uh, they need to be left alone at certain times. Uh, there are times where a shower won't work or, um, you know, the, the bathroom has a problem. But well, they're old buildings, as you point out. Yeah, mo most of them are old. They, they've been renovated to some extent, but they're not, they not weren't designed for yeah. uh, massive special effects like we often have now. Right, which is why Lion King and Wicked are in the newer theaters, because they need that stuff to maintain all of their props and costumes uh and scenery um but uh going back to the performers uh everybody started pretty low down i i i'm going to drop a few names i lucked out when i was in my 20s of working with and becoming friendly with uh some very big stars now who I don't see anymore. They've become movie stars, but they were in my living room. We'd go out for coffee. They were in shows. They took the small parts first. I had Bruce Willis, Denzel Washington, Meryl Streep, Kevin Klein. These people, when they were young and starting out, they were as excited about this as anybody else. So yes, they become stars and yes, they have their uh, issues. But most people are not a pain in the butt. They just want to do their job uh, and then they go home. So I, I hate to say I wish I had more fun stories. I will tell you, <laughs> without naming anyone, I worked on one show where the star um, at five minutes of eight or whenever the show was starting, five minutes before the show started, every performance would call me in and ask me a business question about the box office. However, that was the time that he decided to get undressed and dressed in his costume. And he would wait until I got there so that at every performance, he would be getting into costume while I was standing there. Lovely. Why? Why? <laughs> I don't know. He's married with children. There's nothing. He didn't seem to have anything to do with that. And you would instantly know his name if I told you, and I will not. Um, and he was delightful, but he had a quirk. Mm-hmm. You know, and you get used to it. What are you going to do? So uh, <laughs> let, let's turn to your book, which is a really remarkable compendium of detailed knowledge about the business side. Uh, and it's intended as a guide for a would-be producer, but it's of uh, a lot of interest to anyone who, who cares about the theater. I, I want to start by asking about uh, set and uh, set design. So to my surprise, uh, you – point out that all Broadway shows rent a theater and it's a quote four wall deal. Explain that. The unlike most regional theaters um, or even Branson, Missouri, which has all of these gorgeous theaters, uh, the Broadway theaters are just empty shells. They uh, certainly they try to keep the seats nice. That's out in the audience. But uh, on stage is a floor 
and electrical sockets along the back brick wall, and that's what you rent. So your designer gets to start from scratch. Uh, every Broadway show puts its own floor on top of the floor that is the stage that you've rented. That blew me away. <laughs> yeah, well, there's so much, uh, so many tracks and so many things that are moving back and forth and up and down that they're cutting holes in this stuff all the time. So in order to protect the theater, that's been the requirement. It's that you cannot, you cannot do anything to our building. You can put things on top of it. You can add things to it. But when you leave, you're taking everything with you, even if it's an improvement on the theater. I, uh, one show I worked on, we added uh, balconies over uh, the audience uh, for the actors to be talking from. And we thought a great idea. What's the difference? You put some audience in there for the next show. The theater owner said, take them out. We want the theater the way you took it. And that includes, by which I'll, this also just, just shocked me, that includes lights? So it doesn't come with any lights? No lights at all. <laughs> um, not even uh, enough grids sometimes. Sometimes you have to add the bars in uh, to hold the lights. Uh, a chorus line also was the first computerized lighting show. There had never been a computer used uh, for lights until uh, 1976, five, whatever, chorus line. Uh, and it was built over, the reason was, is they wanted to highlight the faces of the dancers as they froze in certain positions. And you had to do that from the audience's right. uh, audience side. So they built it uh, a bar above the audience and they computerized it. Um, that show, I think, and I, I probably shouldn't be quoted, uh, had the most number of lights uh, used to date, and it was about 280 lamps. Well, we've created technologically great advances in which you can have one light perform the work of 10 lights uh, by computer. It can change colors, it can sure. change size, it can move directions. Uh, it takes longer to program it. But since every designer is going to have their own ideas of what they need, uh, and they have their own budgets, so they have to try to make it fit. They get to come into the theater and put lights wherever they want um, and do, you know, and not have to worry about what the theater has. So, so uh, I'll put that in the positive light, yeah. as opposed to the theater could have given them something. Yeah, but they give them nothing. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about two sets that uh, that are were unusual, and I want to ask you a couple questions about them. So in, uh, I think it's the second act of Les Mis, when the barricade comes together, uh, I think in every time I've ever seen it, the audience just applauds wildly uh, just for the set. Uh, they think that's the coolest thing. And I would also, uh, t as another example, use uh, the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime, which has a remarkable, and you allude to it in the book, has a remarkably creative uh, set design. So somebody has to think those up. They have to build them for the theater itself. Uh, but then the show ends and somebody the show sometimes goes on tour or it crosses the ocean. So I actually saw a curious incident in London and New York, and I was curious, is the set going to be the same? And of course, it was ex I think it was, a quote, exactly. I don't know if it literally was, but it, to the eye of the audience, it looks exactly the same. Well, How did that happen? Did somebody, did they store the stuff? Did they recreate it? Did they rebuild it each time? Uh, uh, and do they yeah. fit it to the theater that it's now playing in? Not every theater obviously can hold some sets. So that might limit where it tours to, but how does that work? Uh, they rebuild it. Uh, the original design uh, for Broadway is designed to hopefully wow the audience a little bit or be the best it can be. Uh, certainly, if you're going to tour the show afterwards, you want to replicate it, but Trucks and trucking stuff and the travel time involved is very expensive. So you have your designer redesign um, the uh, logistics of how that design is going to look somewhere else. And as you said, every touring theater has different dimensions. The West End, even on Broadway, 
very different size theaters. Some of them are raked, meaning uh, they slope toward the audience. Uh, some of them, uh, some of the audiences are raked. Where Hamilton is, the audience in the uh, in on the main floor in the back of the audience is higher than it is down by the stage. Every theater is slightly different and has its own characteristic. So the designers, uh, in addition, let me throw in a very important feature. New York City has the most stringent fire code in the world. Uh, when, if you light a cigarette on stage, there are two stagehands who have been specially trained and licensed standing with fire extinguishers on each side of the stage for that particular moment. And they can go back and do whatever else they're doing. Uh, so when you see a you know, fire or any sort of thing on stage, there's a lot going on backstage. And New York has never had a fire that the audience had to worry about. So whether it's right or wrong, of course, you can go to Chicago and you can do what you want. <laughs> you know, so you have those issues. In addition, all scenery in New York is fireproofed. Every piece of lumber on stage, every wire must have a certification that is fireproof. When you see a big curtain, a scrim or the uh, house curtain at the beginning of the show costs infinitely more money than just having a curtain because it is fireproofed and it must be certified and the fire department does inspections arbitrarily. They give you no warning. They show up five minutes before your show starts and you walk them around and they check everything. And they check paperwork before your show uh, goes into rehearsal and they make sure everything that's going into the floor, everything that's going in there is fireproof. So uh, the unions, of course, that build this stuff in New York are not required in other cities either. So if you do a show in uh, Minneapolis at the Guthrie Theater and you want to bring it into New York, you have to rebuild your set with union people. With from scratch, fire, from, from scratch. scratch. It's not like, you, it's not like you're going to paint it, the old one, and with the fireproof stuff. It's exactly. <laughs> you are paying for the whole thing over. Wow. Hey, take it a step further. If you're on the Tony Awards, uh, Tony Awards are Radio City Musical. They're not in your theater. Where are your set pieces? You have to re you have to build new ones. It's a fortune. Yeah, you point out that that the Tony Awards are a very uh, mixed blessing sometimes. Yeah. Very expensive to be part of, and then that can kill a show, right? Absolutely, it kills is... more shows than it helps. <laughs> which is hard it to believe. Is... Um, <laughs> uh, one other technical thing I want to ask you about, which you mentioned in the book, but it's something that fascinates me, is um, is understudies. And I I saw um, I saw Les Mis in 1985, and I was so excited to see it. And Colm Wilkinson had gotten these incredible reviews, and uh, we showed up. Uh, that how we got there is a long story. I'm not going to tell. I think I may have told part of it before, but we showed we got into the theater uh, with a scalp ticket that put us in the very last row of the theater. <laughs> uh, and it's a big theater uh, where in 1985, I don't know. And so uh, we get a little piece of paper in our program, Playbill. And I learned from your book that Playbill has a, an eternal monopoly on programs on Broadway. That's right. And that someone is paid a special fixed amount uh, to slip that piece of paper in that says there's going to be a uh, an understudy in a particular role. And that the amount they're paid is different for a musical and a drama. <laughs> Just, it's utterly fascinating. We've had, we've had a lot of negotiations yeah. over the years. So I get to the theater and a uh, little piece of paper says that the role of um, Jean Valjean will not be played by Colm Wilkinson. It will be played by Kevin Markham. So we're devastated and disappointed. And we saw one of the greatest three hours of my life. I was uh, an unbelievable performance and I couldn't imagine how Colm Wilkinson could be better. But, uh, and I... Uh, it was so, as the understudy, you could see that he was, Kevin um, Markham was was just, his face in, his, in the curtain, in the number of curtain calls he took was just, it was very gratifying to see him have his chance. Tragically, uh, he died that night from uh, a heart attack uh, induced by cocaine. So it's an incredible, 
example of, uh, again, that roller coaster of emotion. Here's this person has the high point of his life, I'm sure, and, um, and dies tragically. But more generally, the question I want to I want to ask is. Well, and then, by the way, you uh, I'm sure you've read the story just recently with Les Mis. Yes. And he yes. lost uh, the Horrible. same thing. Just he fell off a balcony. We don't know this. Yeah. That's you know, a, it, it's a hard. These things happen. We've had accidents in shows. Um, people have lost legs during rehearsal when the technology, uh, the, the roller skating musical by Andrew Lloyd Webber. Um, I'm Starlight, Starlight, Starlight Express. Express. Right, Starlight Express. Um, there are accidents. Uh, a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, performer in one of the Disney musicals, Adrian Bailey, fell. Um, and uh, he's okay, but he will never perform again because of that. Um, there, there have been accidents, of course, in uh, Spider Man, which is a story unto itself. Uh, and they had to, you know, redo the entire show because of those accidents. So, it, it, you know, and by the way, interestingly enough, there is a clause for all actors. It's called extraordinary risk. Uh, and they make a whopping $20 a week more than their salary <laughs> in order to accept extraordinary risk. If they're asked to climb a ladder, if they're going to fly through the air, $20. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Negotiations are amazing. But but back That's, to the general your point. Yes, your back point. to the general issue of understudies. So, uh, in if you've experienced that as a as a theater goer, that that the person you wanted to see isn't in the show, it's very disappointing. Obviously, although again, it's they're all the understudies are awfully talented uh, and often just gloriously uh, wonderful in the role. But you always wonder, like, what happened? Did the person feel like Taking a day off is two performances a day, just too demanding. Sometimes I always wondered whether if I if I buy a ticket to the matinee, am I risking the probability that the stars will not will not perform? How, what are the what are the rules of understudies? And uh, you can tell the story from your book of the person who was always getting ill and then yeah. feeling better. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, and because of those stories, because of of certain people's um rudeness uh for the most part and i'm going to even go as far as saying 99 percent of performers will never miss a show if they can make it it's usually a doctor uh certainly if you're in a uh a show which requires a lot of singing if a doctor says uh you have a choice you either take tonight and tomorrow night off and rest your voice or you're going to miss four weeks of it in a couple, a few weeks from now, maybe never sing again. Um, the managers require uh, serious, you know, you trust people to a certain extent. If they have the flu, they have the flu. But they're trying to come back. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think I only know of one story of someone who really wanted to get out of their job. And they're allowed to. They have an out they can give notice if they really want to but get it. But it's not paid. like you felt like a personal day. No, yeah, <laughs> personal, it's not. They really don't take it. There are, uh, I do know, for example, on Chorus Line, um, which we had no real stars. But when people said, you know, my aunt is getting remarried on this day four months from now. Can I have that night off? The answer was no, uh, which... Some producers are nicer than that. I, I thought that was a bit rude to say no. You know, someone who's been in the show for four years, they're asking for one person yeah, a month. it seems, yeah. But, they, but then you have to say yes to other people. Yeah. And that's where the problem comes in. So uh, there is a loss of uh, money only after a certain point because you're allowed sick days. Personal days are rarely allowed, although each actor is allowed to have one now. Yeah, but it's under certain circumstances. You have to be in the show for quite a while. You have to build up your credits, very much like a frequent flyer program. Uh, and uh, But for example, your point being is if he was out, he was sick. He was not playing games. So you mentioned there's a vocal captain. Is, is there a vocal captain on every show? 
for every musical? Yes. What does that person do? They rehearse the voices, the harmonies. You know, uh, you have uh, big choral numbers in which uh, people have to remember what their actual notes are. People get lazy. They start to sing the melody when they're supposed to be singing a harmony because the harmony is difficult. So you, you know, it, it'll be for an hour a week. The vocal uh, uh, rehearsal will be an hour in which they'll just go over a song that week. And the next week they'll go over a different song. And it's not everybody who has to show up. But they also, don't they also do some like voice maintenance, physical help for people who are, I mean, it's hard to sing. No, 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 that's a doctor. We okay. Do, do medicine backstage. Uh, we take the, the the vocal coach. A vocal coach, you can an actor can hire their own vocal coach, or many of them do, because doing eight performances a week brutal. It's extremely brutal. Yeah, uh, you know, people say, "Ah, you love singing. What's the big deal?" Well, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of these shows ask you to sing some amazing notes, and you're not doing one song. You're you're singing throughout a few hours. Yeah, if I sang Defying Gravity, uh, I'd sing it once. <laughs> then I'd take a couple of weeks off. <laughs> well, yeah. I, of course, I couldn't if, sing if it. you but... could do it once. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could. Right, With enough preparation, I could do it once. But I couldn't do it twice. I'd for that, Russ. I would pay. <laughs> I, I'd need a break. Um, I, I've, I've noticed most people can't sing it once, uh, in my ex notice, experience. Very few people can sing it like uh, Dina Menzel can. Um, let's move on to the business side. Um, shocking, but a realistic, um, assessment is that you're right. 80% of all Broadway shows lose every penny. Uh, yeah. that's a tough, that's a tough ratio. You know, you know, we always say there's the bad news and the good news. And, uh, unfortunately the good news really sounds like Las Vegas. Um, you know, if you put a nickel in a machine, of course, you're only putting a nickel in, you have a chance of making a thousand dollars, let's say. Well, on Broadway, uh, and I'm going to tell you about one real show that exists right now. They are paying 250 percent per year on the initial investment. So, if you put ten thousand dollars in, you do the math. That's every year for a show that may run for 20, 30 years. Not bad. Um, yeah, in, Sil in Silicon Valley, it's called a unicorn. They're, they're <laughs> yeah. rare, but they somehow right. manage to exist. That's it. Um, and there are enough of them over time, uh, and it will pay for all your losses. I mean, can you afford, you know, we, everyone always tells an investor you have to be willing to and able to lose the money. To be a Broadway investor, you have to be vetted. You cannot put your child's college fund Darn. in a Broadway <laughs> show. You can put your child in a Broadway <laughs> show, but not their college fund. Yeah, life's tough. Yeah, it, it's very tough. It's very exciting uh, watching that money roll in. And then, of course, the manager has to distribute it correctly. Um, that's very difficult. And uh, the audits aren't fun. Uh, but... The other great thing about the Broadway investment that you don't get elsewhere, I think, in, in most businesses, is that after the show closes, you continue to make money. So the show is gone. And when someone does it in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, or a high school does it in California, you're still making money from that. Because the, you are never buying a play from a playwright. You are leasing it. And by leasing, that means the playwright, of course, continues to make money from that show wherever it's done. But because you are the one who helped make that show famous, the playwright owes you, the investors and the producer, some of his or her money over time. And that can be for 40 years. I mean, 40 years of return when you have a hit. Not bad, again. Um, and that comes from the record album from any television version of it if they make a movie it all comes back in smaller portions but it comes back to the original investors uh going back to the bad news 80 percent uh is pretty bad you really have to love theater um 
I, and, as, and as you point out many times that, and it's, I think most people understand this, strangely enough, people don't know which of the 10 shows, the eight are going to be the failures. <laughs> it's, it, it should be obvious, ex post, but ex ante, everybody thinks they could have a hit. Yeah. Well, and Wicked, when it played in San Francisco before it came to New York, they were trying it there, got very mixed reviews. People weren't sure it was going to make it in New York. So you just don't know the opposite way either. And uh, the famous stories of uh, the show, um, Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, which is now a staple in musical theater. Uh, it played in Washington, D.C. before it came to New York, and it bombed. No one laughed. No one liked it. The critics hated it. The audience didn't like it. And they worked on it, and they fixed it. They brought it to New York, and it became a major hit. It happens, you know, just like in the movies. But a lot of times they fix it, and it's still not any good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I just I saw If Then when it opened in D.C. Mm. with Adina Menzel, and it was a very – it was fun to see Adina Menzel, but it's not – I didn't think it was a very good show, and they, they knew it. And they changed a lot. And again, people walked out of that show with the same – with the shrug. Uh, unlike the description I gave a Wicked, people walked – I talked to a lot of people as they came out. And they were just like, yeah, it was okay. So they, they tried to fix it, but I don't think it did very well. Oh, and it still comes down to the original talent. You know, these shows um, – if, if we put a bad set on a stage, if the show is wonderful, it's still going to be a hit. That's my belief. Um, a lot of audiences want, you know, I've had people walk out of shows saying, but the costumes weren't special. It's like, really? Is that what you came here to see? Uh, you know, like, didn't like the show. Was it worth the experience? And, and mm. people who haven't gone to the theater don't always, always get it. They don't really understand what it can do for their psyche and their uh, state of mind in life and how it can change their children's lives. Uh, just in understanding how we live day to day and how we deal with our other jobs or our real jobs or, or our families, uh, we learn a lot as well as how hopefully have a good time, uh, you know, on, with a great Broadway show when it happens. Yeah, I'm not. I mean, I like I like a good costume myself, but it's not it's not a deal breaker. Uh, uh, <laughs> And by the way, we're not going to have time for it, but your descriptions of how costumes are made and the cost is in the book are, is just is extremely interesting. And it's, um, again, it's something you don't think about that basically you have uh, custom designed clothing for all the actors and act and, and cast. Just um, it's not a, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge. Well, yeah, and it has to survive a performance oh, right. yeah. week and being washed and dry cleaned and the beads have to stay on and it had some. They have to be sometimes handmade, and then they have to be adapted for the understudy. And then, uh, you know, a, a very quick story, very funny story about the Beast and Beauty and the Beast. Uh, we were moving the show to uh, Tokyo and Osaka, Japan, and they have their own system there, their own unions. They have a very different way of acting. Everything's very different there. And the Beast was four foot ten, so we had to convince the uh, the vice president. I assume that's Beast shorter in, than the Beast in New York. Uh, sorry, yes, the Beast in New York was <laughs> six foot two, uh, maybe six foot four. I forget. So the idea was, you don't just tell Japan you must use the same costume because Disney requires all costumes to look the same wherever it goes. We had to explain that to the vice president, and it took a lot of explaining. The designer had to come in and re design the entire thing to look correct and to have the correct effect on a short person. Wow. So on the, um, the other impression you get from uh, reading your book is the complexity of the union world. Um, there are minimums all over the place. There are special rules all over the place. There are special rules about who can do what, touch what. Teamsters unload the truck with the scenery on the sidewalk, but they won't take it into the theater et cetera, et cetera. And, there's, and the, the, the minutia of it is really quite extraordinary and, um, and fascinating. And that's why you, uh, um, maybe unlike other businesses, I can't be sure, but that's why the manager, why I'm so proud 
of having been the manager because it's our job to know this or else the penalties are, are amazing. Plus, you want everyone working with you, you know, all 200 of them, to enjoy the job so they give you a whole bunch of extra time and freebies and, you know, they come up with ideas that somebody else wouldn't have thought of to help save you money or to make the show better. You get all of that when people enjoy working on a project. Uh, and even though there may be 15 or $16 million behind the project that also the managers are responsible for to make sure it's spent correctly, to know where it went. Um, by the way, that's the other fun part of my job. In eight weeks, I get to spend 15 or $16 million. That's my job to spend it all. And then we get to opening night, and then we got to every week worry about the next amount of money. It's a lot of fun, except it's exhausting. And again, I don't think anybody on the outside has any idea of this, but you just think, well, you just go advertise. You, you put an ad in the, <laughs> you put a, an ad in the New York Times. But it's uh, again, like it's very much like a startup. The cash flow is crucial, and if you don't manage it correctly, you die. Yes, and uh, and there are rules all over the place. For example, in the New York Times, you know, it happens all the time. Uh, press agents get yelled at. Why aren't we in the New York Times more? Well, the reason is because they have a rule, and they if they like your press agent, they will give you one article the week before you open, and that's it. You don't get any more unless, you know, if somebody dies or something, that's news. But people keep thinking that the newspapers and the online bloggers want to help Broadway. They don't. They're in business to sell their papers or their blog or whatever else they're doing. Uh, and you've got your press agents out there who are trying to trick them <laughs> into talking about your yeah. show. Yeah, that's how it works. And that's why you have a star. Dina Menzel, you went to see her in If Then. If I just told you there's a show If Then, you might not want to go. No, no, she so, she carried a lot of a lot of oh, weight there. She did. <laughs> yeah, that and that poor show. I, I almost had money in that show. I did not. And uh that, but they kept that show running for quite a while. Isn't that nice? Yeah. It, that's the manager who did that, the wonderful general manager. She just has this knack for understanding how to keep a show running. And that's the other thing that you want your managers to be able to do is to bring their experience to uh, survival on Broadway because so many shows are going to lose all of their money. So I want to come back to the unions. So – there are all kinds of rules, obviously. Again, as an outsider, you have no idea of how many rules there are. Things like minimum number of musicians and minimum pay for the person, again, who puts the money, the little notice in the playbill, et cetera, et cetera. And the, good, the upside of that you were mentioned in the book is that uh, there's, there's very little negotiation. Of course, these are minimum. Some people do negotiate for higher pay, but I assume a lot of performers, dancers and, and musicians get the minimum. Correct. Uh, and so the, the upside of that is you don't negotiate it. It's all understood. But presumably some of those salaries are set a little higher than they have to be, which creates uh, a supply of people desperate to get at those opportunities that in a more negotiated or free market, uh, there would be lower salaries and presumably possibly lower ticket prices. Um, talk about what do you think of it? Of the ups and the pluses and minuses of the un that environment, which is very New York, as you point out, it's very un well, it's very unusual. Well, you're talking to someone who, having worked with all these unions, and there are 18 of them, just to scare everybody away, <laughs> and they all have rule books that are 100 pages or longer with tiny print, and they've all been negotiated. Uh, there, there's an association, the the Broadway League, which represents the theater owners and producers. And so they negotiate on one side. And then, of course, each union, one at a time, negotiates on its own behalf. Very little changes, actually, from one negotiation to the other. But as with the, the uh, history of unions, in the old days, there were kneecaps broken. There were people's lives that were lost. Actors were not paid. Producers left town without paying them at all. And you know, an actor wants to be in a show. So if you say, you know what, we're just collecting our money, we'll 
pay you on Wednesday, what are they going to do? They're going to go out and be unemployed. Of course, they're going to do the show again. And this not only happened to actors, it happened to stagehands and musicians. Uh, at a certain point, the union said, you know what? We want a pension. We want health care. And we understand we have so many people who love working in the theater that you're not going to give it to us. So everybody kind of got together and said uh, that there would be a basic minimum and we would have health care, we would have pensions. There's not much more that these unions are doing for most of their workers. These rules have been created not to hurt the theater, but because the people who know how to put this stuff together, it saves money for the producer. We've learned that if you let the musicians and the actors during a rehearsal take lunch at a different time, it saves you money. No one's sitting around waiting for the other one to be ready. If you figure out that we need to take photos for the press um, and we need to fit it in around rehearsals and we need to do, they've come up with the times where it's free and how many times it's free because it will save the show money. If the show wants to do something outside the rules, it can do it. It just costs money. And it would cost money anyway. Do you, th do you think, um, so one of the things you mentioned is that uh, you use often, I assume maybe always, use a payroll company that's very versed in the, in the minutiae that we're talking about here. Right. Right. Uh, so that for the manager, Dealing with this is something I'm sure it takes a lot of experience, but you, you get used to it. And it's kind of as you as you discuss in the book, it's just the way things are. It's just that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. do, do producers feel that way, you think? No, <laughs> of course. not. Well, that's part of it's a small reason uh, why I'm proud of the book is I'm not it's not my job to convince America that unions are the answer to everything. Um, not even going to start that argument, okay? But on Broadway, the rules make it possible to put on an unbelievably intricate project in the shortest period of time with the best talent that America or the world perhaps has to offer. They all come here. So um, for the manager... To that, that's what we do in our apprenticeship and in our seminars. We are learning these rule books. Of course, we don't memorize them. Uh, you have the rule books with you. You can always go back and refer to it. Um, you know, even the doorman backstage. Uh, for me, in the theater, he's not getting paid that much. I'm happy he has some health care. You know, it, that's really the basis of all of this. Now, how much does he get paid? What happens if he's only willing, if he's the nephew of the theater owner and he's only willing to work eight hours a week? Well, we have to have some rules. What's that worth? Because we're not going to sit around and negotiate it. So that's been figured out for us. We just look it up and you pay it. So that's some of the upside. I, I wonder. I'm sorry. You're going back. The producers all think, well, at, at least the famous story, which I think is changing now was that the reason for the high prices on Broadway are the stagehands and the musicians. And having been the person who writes the budget, who follows the budget, maintains the budget, and who has, on a day-to-day -day basis, runs the show, that's the manager, that's not true. And when I tell you that there's a show on Broadway making 250% uh, a year for its in, uh, investors, that's great. But there's not a penny more being paid to anyone working on that show. So the question becomes, who are you hurting and who's greedy here? And I'm not saying I don't want those investors to make a lot. I want them coming back. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Well, yeah, when, you make, when you lose eight out of 10, you better have some winners. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you. I'm absolutely in agreement with you. Yeah. But you also need to have the best talent willing to be there. And New York is very expensive. They need to be able to live. And if you have a person working on wigs for a show like Wicked 
which has a lot of wigs or some other show, and they're going home and they have to, at the age of 35, still live with three other people in a broken down flat in Brooklyn. And you're working at the top of the chain of the theater world. There's something a little embarrassing about that when they're putting in 54 hours a week. Yeah, I think, I think the question is, in the absence of the complex labyrinthine set of rules and, and minimums, what would happen in the absence of that? And I, I maybe a great wig maker would still go home to a, a, a shared flat, but maybe not. I think that it's hard to know. One thing I would worry about, and, and by the way, you, you can tell I'm a big fan of Broadway. So yeah, I, yeah. you can't okay. say it's broken. Uh, it's working either in spite of or because of all this complexity. But I think one thing to think about, and it's a similar issue in 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 the movie world for for I think different reasons. But it's um, it's hard to make a small show. Small shows struggle. The, the shows that that um, that I think get staged are often the grandest shows that can cover all the fixed costs of these overcoming all these issues. Um, and maybe it just it wouldn't, it wouldn't be any other way because it's New York City and the costs are just too high no matter what. But it is an interesting thing that people want a blockbuster. They don't want to make a modest amount of money for a decent amount of time. I guess an exception would be something like Once, the yeah. show. The show Once is – there's no – it's an incredibly simple stage. Um, very talented musicians carry the – carry the show and a, and a two star performers make it work on top of that. And it's a clever show and it's magical. It's a wonderful, wonderful show, but it's not, it's not phantom. And there's no, there's no chandelier moving around. There's, you're not landing a helicopter on stage, but I do think there is a bias on, on Broadway f for a bunch of reasons, not just the ones we're talking about toward, toward a blockbuster. What you're talking about though, it changed. I mean, I, I believe I lived through this. I saw it happen when Disney, and Cameron McIntosh uh, produced on Broadway, the standard yeah. changed. Yep. Now we had to compete because the tourists, not necessarily New Yorkers, you know, Broadway used to be a very elitist New York thing with a few tourists ch chiming in. A big hit show like My Fair Lady ran a couple of years. Right. It's a different thing now. Very different. Now they're running 20, 25 years because of tourists, not because of New Yorkers. They never should have, they never should have cleaned up Times Square. This wouldn't have, <laughs> this wouldn't have happened. Well, it, it seems to be sliding back. <laughs> yeah, I've noticed. I've noticed. So, um, no, you're absolutely right. And, and that was thanks to the theater owners, by the way. The yeah, no, I know. Yeah. Together and cleaned it up because New York wasn't. Well, Mitch, we're over time. I just I want to close with a, with a related question. I'll let you, let you finish, uh, finish this up. Um, there are a lot of ups and, and cycles on Broadway. There's, we just talked about one, this, the role of the blockbuster. Um, now we have Hamilton, which is a, it's hip hop. It's going to be, it's going to have a, I'm sure some, some effect on what else people think might succeed. There are always shows being revived. There are always people saying Broadway's dying. There are no new good shows. Then something like Hamilton comes along or, uh, next to normal. That's a very different show than the mainstream shows that people have expected or Rent, which is a transformative show that just changes the way people think uh, is what what might succeed. Reflect on that that those cycles and trends in your experience and what you think might uh, might be coming. Well, if I had first of all, if I had that answer, I would have. <laughs> I would take every penny I had and I would uh, jump in. Um, the it does run on a ten year cycle. Uh, there are shows of certain uh we go through jukebox musicals uh we go through the andrew lloyd weber serious musical phase um we go through um just fluff you know di different choices at different times it reflects our society and the politics and uh, the economy um certainly when 9 11 hit uh, we just needed fun. Everyone, uh, Broadway survived basically because it was entertaining people. Uh, that doesn't, that wasn't much room for a serious drama. Uh, th that's no longer the case. And we have some amazing shows. Um, I don't know what the next step is. Uh, we 
Sometimes we overdo it with revivals because it's easy money. You already know that what the show is about. Um, you have to decide if the tourists matter more than the New Yorkers, whether you're doing it for art. Uh, and there are producers who do it for art and luck out by making money. Um, and you want to basically guess what our society is going to become. It's really hard to know. Um, the great thing, like I said, for me, working in the theater, I don't have to worry about whether or not um, it's going to survive. Uh, it's First of all, it's booming. I've never seen it like this. We are making a fortune. Of course, those premium price seats, which I am one of the few people on Broadway totally against. I, I just see it as greed. Um, but people are willing to buy it. And that's our marketplace. It may sustain a few shows that might not otherwise make it. You never know. Right. Although that doesn't happen because people, <laughs> the, the shows, it's only that the best are shows, yeah. <laughs> don't care to, they, to spend extra on those shows. Yeah. True. So even though they may have those prices available, they're not selling. Um, it's, it's scary. I, I don't want Broadway to become the airlines where we start charging, uh, you know, you want to seat in this row versus that row. And I know it's being discussed. Uh, we'll, we'll see where it goes. Hopefully we're still out there to say we can make money off of really entertaining uh, drama and musicals and sometimes even make art along the way and help our culture. It still is a cultural institution. And most of us who are working there believe that. Uh, we just at the same time would like to keep our jobs and make some money. <laughs> You know, so it, it, it's that combination. So I don't know if I can answer your question, Russ. If you have an idea of where it's going, tell me. Uh, well, you know, I don't know either, of course. I don't know is my favorite phrase. Uh, <laughs> my guest today has been Mitch Weiss. His book is The Business of Broadway. Mitch, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Russ, thank you for talking to me. I really appreciate it. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>